Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Freedman's uh, Speaker Series. Um, my name is Norbert Wilson, and I want to welcome you all to today's uh, lecture. Our speaker for today is Professor Emily Broad Lieb. She is Assistant Clinical Professor of Law and the Director of the Harvard Law School Food Law and Policy Clinic. She is also the Deputy Director of the Harvard Law, Cent uh, Harvard Law School Center for Health Law and Policy Inter Innovation. Professor Broad Lieb founded the Harvard's uh, found at Harvard's Food Law and Policy Clinic, the first law school clinic in the nation devoted to providing legal and policy guidance on food law and policy issues. Um, Professor Broadlieb focuses her scholarship, teaching, and practice on finding solutions to the biggest health, economic, and environmental issues facing our food system. She has published scholarly articles in the California Law Review, Wisconsin Law Review, the Harvard Law and Policy Review, the Food Law, uh, Food and Drug Law Journal, and the Journal of Food Law and Policy, among others. On a personal note, I got to know um, Emily many years ago when I was a faculty member at, at Auburn University, and I reached out to her uh, to participate in a grant and because of her work in Mississippi. And I will say from that moment and ever since, we have had a, a, a wonderful working relationship um, she has a generous spirit and um, a great mentor. So I want to uh, uh, welcome Emily to come up and talk to us about food waste. All right. I had to move this over here because I'm a little too short to actually see you over the screen. So hopefully um, now I can actually see everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Um, it's, it's really fantastic. We've had... Um, not only have Norbert and I have had a, a personal relationship for some time, but I've had a relationship with a lot of folks here at the Friedman School um, faculty, and then we've had many amazing Friedman students work in the Food Law and Policy Clinic during terms in our summers. We have a couple on our staff right now, so um, I have really uh, a lot of love for this, this institution and our longstanding partnership. Um, so I'm going to talk today about our work in food waste policy. Um, I'm going to kind of start by explaining how this fits into what the clinic does more broadly. Um, it's one of, of some of the different pillars. I'll just put this up, actually. Um, so uh, I like to start by taking a moment to explain what a clinic is in the law school setting and, and, and sort of the framing of the work that we do. Um, so clinics in law school settings are really intended as ways for students to get out of sitting in the classroom and actually get hands-on experience working on real projects that would be, you know, as they're supposed to be professionals when they graduate, that would be uh, modeling the work that they'll do when they graduate. Um, in traditionally, clinics were really um, uh, law students representing low-income, vulnerable individuals in individual representation in administrative hearings or in court. Um, and over the past as, as clinics have evolved, we've built more clinics that, that give students exposure to other types of skills. So in my program, students are learning about the substance of the food system. So I'm teaching them in the classroom. I teach a course that really spans um, all aspects of the food system. It's kind of a survey of the laws regulating the food system. Um, and then they're getting skills that are hands-on and actually doing policy work. So I'm going to talk about the kinds of skills that they work on and the kinds of projects that we do um, through the lens of food waste. Um, so you can see here we have four different areas that we work in, sustainable food production, food access and nutrition, reducing food waste, and um, community food system planning. And here's just uh, what it looks like to practice in this space. So here's some of the uh, reports or projects we've put out and some of the clients that we've had. Um, and since I'm going to focus on food waste, let me tell you really briefly about a couple other things that we're, we're doing. In terms of the food access and nutrition piece, we're, we've been doing a big project the last few years, working with communities that apply to us for technical assistance on pri uh, policies to reduce the consumption of sugar. So this has had, we, we're not publicly stating the communities we're working in, but we're, we've worked in six communities now in the Northeast, the South, the Midwest, um, on a range of different topics that they've brought to us. So some have been really looking at sugar sweetened beverage taxes. Some of them are looking at uh, healthy default policies. So policies that would require restaurants to serve um, milk, water, or juice instead of soda as the default, although people can request something else. Um, so that's one project. 
Um, in terms of our community food system planning, this is actually where the, the, the entire clinic started from was uh, I've been doing community work in Mississippi, which you heard at the beginning. And really, uh, what I realized was that there's a lot of knowledge and interest from community members in changing the policies that structure their food system. So you can see here, we've worked with like the Pittsburgh Food Policy Council, the Mississippi Food Policy Council, um, a lot of community groups like this around the country. And this takes us into whatever issue it is that they're, they know what they want to change and we're helping them understand the laws so that they can figure out how to make a difference there. Uh, right now, we're actually doing a lot of work with the Boston Food, Food Access Council, which is reforming. And I know some, uh, I think a big contingent from Tufts was at the meeting in September. There's another one coming up in December. Um, so it's a great way to get involved here. Uh, and then lastly, sustainable food um, production. Uh, we do a lot of work. We're doing a big project on the U.S. Farm Bill. We're actually putting forward next week a big report to Congress on um, a bunch of recommendations of things that could change in terms of um, incentives to farmers to really reduce the climate impact of agriculture as just one example. And then the other thing, as the first clinic in the country working in this space, um, I realized very early on that I wasn't in a field of law if the field was just me. So I've been spending a lot of time trying to get other law schools to build in this, in this space. Uh, there are now about four other law schools that have clinics like mine that really focus on doing hands-on work. I've done a lot of my, my publications and articles have really been about tracking the development of teaching in this field across law schools all over the U.S. And then these are just some of the initiatives that we've helped build. Um, one example is the Academy of Food Law and Policy, which is an academic association for law faculty that either teach or write in the area of food policy. And we'll be holding our second annual conference in December. And it's a chance for faculty to workshop their scholarship, and build more mentorship within this field of food law and policy. And then we're, we're trying to get more deans of law schools involved in really seeing that this is a field that uh, people can actually get tenure eventually in food law and policy, whereas before they would be interested in this and doing it on the side, but their tenure track would really be in uh, like environmental law or administrative law or something like that. So there's a lot of work to do on building this field, and I think it's been really fun to be at the forefront of really building the collegiality and seeing it grow within law schools. Um, when I first started, after I graduated from Harvard Law School and then spent some time away, and when I came back to start my program, I had to do a lot of convincing of my dean and of my colleagues that this was something worth supporting and worth having as part of our fabric. And um, so now I'm helping others do that same work. So I'm going to talk today about work that we've been doing on food waste. Um, so just to take a zoom out and take a more global view of this, I like to put this map up because I think it's really interesting to see that We've mainly been focused in the U.S. I'll tell you at the end briefly of, about a global project that we're doing now. Um, but this is really a global, a global challenge. So I think about uh, 1.3 billion tons, about a third of food uh, produced globally is wasted, according to the U.N. FAO. Um, the other really interesting thing that you can see from this map is that the, the issues, the, 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 the place on the chain where food is wasted varies from region to region. And what you can see in most regions, the blue circle is larger than the orange. And what that means is that food loss is greater than food waste. Food loss means food kind of post-harvest and in the process of getting it out of the fields, getting it to some place where it's going to be packaged and processed. There's a lot of breaks in that chain where um, produce goes bad along the way and doesn't actually get to a market. And in North America, is the only region where food waste is greater than food loss. What that means is that we're super effective at getting the food. We, we do have, have on-farm loss, um, but it's lower than other places. There's very little loss, actually, after it gets off the farm until it gets to um, the store, the restaurant, the, man, you know, the food, the catering um, you know, institution, or the home. And that's where we have a lot of our waste. So what it means is that some of the policies that are going to work in some regions of the world will be the same. But also, there's going to be really different solutions because of where the waste is occurring. And one thing I won't talk that much about, but in the U.S., we, in particular, a lot of this waste occurs in consumer homes. And that is something that, as someone looking at this with a policy background and trying to use policy as a tool to drive systemic change, it's very hard to change what consumers do in their homes. So we're, we're you know, that's one place where I think it's going to be somewhat tricky to figure out how to, how to get there. Um, in terms of the impact, I'll give a few metrics, but here's one that just came out in August. I think we know there's rising interest in the issue of food waste because of the impact on climate. And that's both because the inputs in food production have, there's climate impacts of that. And then also when food goes to the landfill, it's a huge emitter of methane. 
Um, so according to the, inter, the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, they found that about 8 to 10 percent of total GHG emissions came from food waste and had a lot of recommendations in there about reducing food waste as a method for change. In the U.S., here's just a, a, a snapshot of what it looks like. Um, depending on the estimates, I think we get to about a third and 40 percent of food produced in the U.S. is wasted. Um, and just as one example of the resource waste, 21 percent of water used in the U.S. goes to water crops that we then throw in the trash. So as you think about climate change, exacerbating drought, um, you know, water crises in places, especially in California where we get a lot of our food, and then we're just throwing 20 percent of that water directly into a landfill. Doesn't make that much sense. Um, so a lot of times I get questions about why do we focus on this. So I showed you we have four areas we work on. We have really active projects in all of those areas. But by far, for the last at least five years, if not more, this has been the biggest area that we've worked on. And I think that there's a couple different reasons. So one was all the evidence that I just showed you, that there's a lot of impact of this on climate. We're, we're spending a lot of time growing food and then throwing it away. It doesn't make sense. Um, but the other thing that I like about this work is that there's really, it's one of those sort of triple bottom line areas where there can be a lot of beneficial impacts of reducing waste beyond the environment. Um, so one piece of it would be for people. What we find is actually when you start thinking about this food as a resource, a lot of it is safe and edible food that really can get to people in need or people in their households can make better decisions if they know what to be thinking about in terms of that food, particularly in low-income households, if they can understand some of the, uh, you know, reasons that they commonly throw food away and make those changes, they actually can make their own food dollars go further. And then in terms of profit, which is the third prong of this sort of triple bottom line um, bliss point, if you will, uh, is that you could, when you actually treat this food as a resource, it generates uh, revenue. Uh, as one example, Massachusetts, which I'll, I'll come back to, has a law now that bans businesses from sending more than a certain amount of food to the landfill. In per week. It's a ban of over one ton per week, although they're considering reducing that. And what they found is that in, as that was implemented in the first two years of that law, 500 new jobs were created and $175 million in new revenue was created. And it was literally just from t treating food as a resource instead of treating it as trash. So that money, the, a lot of those jobs were created in food banks and startups in the food recovery space. Um, and composting and anaerobic digestion, which also created useful byproducts that could then be sold. Um, so I think there's a lot of reasons that this, is, that this is really helpful. And then I think also thinking about food waste is a microcosm of a lot of the other issues that I'm concerned about in the food system. So, you know, if you think about animal welfare, what's just boiling it down to the fact that we are harming animals and then throwing away a lot of the products of the uh, uh, animal products. Those are probably some of the most wasted products in the U.S. Um, so there's a lot of reasons to focus on this. All right, so now I'm going to be a little bit interactive and hopefully loop this back into the solutions we're working on. So a couple of people, just tell me what you think are some causes of waste. Perfect. So we'll get to that. This is um, a huge, I think, issue um, and was really our entry point into this work was that there's all these labels on food products. According to a study that Walmart did, they found just in Walmart branded items that there were 47 different best buy, sell by, use by, enjoy by labels on their products. And that consumers are like, I don't know what this means. How do I know what I'm supposed to do with this product? So that's the reason people throw things away. Why else is food wasted? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right, so packaging big portions are big too. If you go to a restaurant, you know, you, it's, it's like very difficult to order something that's the right size to be able to eat, which leads to a lot of waste too. And I think part of this also relates to the fact that in the U.S. today, food, the, the per capita cost of food is lower than it's been in any country at any point in time. And of course, there's huge distributional impacts. Uh, not everyone has money to even put food on their table every week, let alone throughout the year. Um, but on the whole, we don't, our food doesn't cost very much, so you can afford to make packages bigger, to put more on plates, and to throw, for consumers to throw food away it doesn't hurt them as much as if it costs a lot of money and they were really thinking about every dollar spent. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I think uh, one example might be you buy a tomato, you think you're going to put it in a salad, it gets a little bit mushy, and if people don't really know how to cook, they just, they're like, I can't use this for what I thought I would use it for, and rather than know how to be creative or prepare something else, or even to use the freezers, and so there's, I think there's a lot of reasons food's wasted in the home. Why do you think businesses might throw food away instead of doing something else with it? Yeah. Mm. Great. So it's following. Okay. So one piece might be consumers are harming the product, so we should be more cautious. But in addition, I mean, let's say at the end of the day, there are extra avocados that aren't that aren't touched. What might the store do with those? Why would they not do something? Mm-hmm. And does the store just to follow, do any donation, or is that you know why might the store not donate? Okay. Those evil lawyers. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to be one of them. I wish I could have like a different name that was like a kind, gentle lawyer that's not trying to litigate. Um, yeah, lawyers are horrible and they're, you know, so people are afraid of litigation partly for good reasons, partly because um, we're a really litigious society and people are sued for all kinds of crazy things. Some of the fear maybe is unfounded, but I think it, you know, there's this, this like threat that could be really bad for image, costly, et cetera. So I think that's a really big one. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. So then there's cost involved too. And I would say like in terms of donation, you just hit on the two biggest issues. One is fear of, you know, you're doing something that you're getting no value from, but you may have a huge cost on the other side if someone were sick and you were sued. And then the other is the cost of actually collecting that food, training your staff to treat it differently. Maybe you need extra sto- uh, freezer or refrigerator space to store it. How are you going to get it somewhere? Um, so there's a lot of cost. It's not free to take the food and put it into some other stream. Yeah. The consumer level? Yeah, so the data, right, 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 right. The best data that I've seen is that of the, let's say, 40% that's wasted, eight, more than 80% of that happens at restaurant, retail, and homes, and I think like half of, you know, roughly half of that at each of those. So, and I, again, I think one, one thing that a lot of people have been talking about in this space is that um, we don't have great data on this nationally. Like these numbers that are being pulled together, a lot of them are extrapolated from like really small samples to try to get our arms around the issue, but um, I think everyone knows it's an issue. There's anecdotal evidence. There is the data that we have on waste shows it to be really high, but I think, um, for, especially for folks who are more in the research side, that there's a lot of room here as well to try to figure out more precisely where this is happening. Um, yes, yeah. Okay, so what are some solutions? Any thoughts? Like if you wanted to think about this on a systems level, what might you want to do to try to make something happen differently? Yeah? Right. Yes, well, that's 100%. I mean, I think um, immigration, other kind of um, like loss of workers at, at key times on farms leads to a lot of waste happening. Um, but I think you're right in general that there's, there's you know, an infusion of, of money to farms to harvest things that they wouldn't otherwise harvest. So it could be that they've lost the labor that they thought they needed. It could be that they, they max out. They're sort of like, we filled this contract for the amount of tomatoes we were growing, and now we have extra, and I have nowhere to really send them, nor do I have, like, the time or resources to pick them and send them somewhere else. So to turn it into a solution side, get, getting money to farms to say, you know, you, you'll be valued, the, the, the product that you're giving will be valued. One way to do that would be through tax incentives, which I'll talk about. Other thoughts on solutions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Exactly. I'm going to talk about that a little bit. So, right, we, you know, we don't know because we don't have great data exactly how much of an impact it will have, although there's a lot of research being done 
Um, but I think we know that it's, it's a low-hanging fruit. It's, you know, they already have labels on there. Could we make those labels clear? It's not a lot of cost involved in just moving away, you know, changing a label around to make it clear. Any other thoughts on solutions? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's great. So secondary markets, so I think just extrapolating that a little bit, um, supporting innovation. So there's lots of actually, as people are starting to realize how much extra food there is, building second mar- secondary markets, building um, nonprofit supermarkets, um, and I'm going to get to it in just a second, Daily Table, which we've worked with for a while, that is a nonprofit grocery store that was built um, in order to really take surplus food and other food that wouldn't be used a lot of it gets prepared into healthy meals that people could reheat at home, um, but, but just getting it at a low cost into communities that need that. So, um, but there are challenges with doing things that are really innovative, especially with food, which is highly regulated. So uh, let me turn to some of the ones that we've worked on. You guys have brought us up, and there's so many. I mean, we, we, you know, these are some of the ones that we've really, really spent time on, and that I'm going to go through a couple of them. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that, you know, as we think about solutions to reduce food waste, obviously the worst place for food to go is to a landfill. Anything we can do to avoid that is great. But I think there's been a lot of work done by the EPA, and, and a lot of other countries have something similar to this, helping businesses and, um, you know, anyone involved in the space to really think about the priorities. So the number one thing would be reducing the amount of food. So if we know grocery stores are overordering and the avocados are left over, let's try to right-size the order, let's not bring food somewhere it's not going to be used. If it, is, if it gets there and can't be used, let's get it to people, because food for people requires the most inputs of energy and resources and time because of all the regulations to make sure that it's safe. So if we know it's safe for people and it's still safe, let's get it to people. The next would be to animals, to replace growing more food for animals, and so on. Um, and then these are some of the issues that we that we've worked on, and I think I would bucket them into a couple spaces. So there's, I would say, like kind of three main barriers to food um, being donated or recovered. One is the law itself being a barrier. So there are things that weren't allowed to be done, and now we're trying to use this food, you know, in ways. For example, um, let's say we work with an organization that was taking excess feed grains that were for animals. They're, they're classified as feed grains, which means they're not allowed to go into the human food supply. But what they found is there's a lot of waste there as well. And for some of these, if you process them into food products and handle them properly, they actually there's no reason they couldn't be for food. You just wouldn't want to eat that corn as corn at your dinner table because it's not very tasty. Um, so, but, they're, but they're running into these regulatory barriers where if you're doing something really new, the law becomes a hindrance. I think the other type of area I would say would be carrots. So let's make incentives. So this is where we come into, if there's a cost associated with donating, let's give businesses some incentive to make them want to do that. And then the last would be sticks. Um, if we want people to really not throw food away, then let's tax the wasting of food or penalize the wasting of food. And that will find its way into more successful solutions along the way. Um, so you know these are not aligned to that exactly, but I'm going to talk through a couple of the ones that we've worked on. I probably won't get to all of them, but I'll talk about a couple. And, and just talk about how it is that we go about thinking about these and working on them. Um, so I mentioned before that our, our, we've worked for some years with Daily Table. I actually got to know Doug Rao, who's the founder of Daily Table, before Daily Table was even a thing. It was an idea, and he, we had lunch, and he said, um, I have a really great idea. He'd previously been the president of Trader Joe's and said, even in a very environmentally conscious retail chain, I noticed that we were wasting a lot of food and that a lot of it was safe and healthy, and particularly, among a a bunch of reasons in particular, what I learned about was that these dates on food are really just about freshness and taste, which is very subjective. They're not really well vetted in terms of, you know, how that date is even placed on the food, yet as a, a, you know, top-line retailer, we we didn't want to sell them past the date, you know, but, but we know that they're safe. What can we do with them? Um, And he was really dejected because he had found out, he had been told that in Massachusetts it was illegal to sell or donate food after the date. So we embarked on a project to really understand this. And the first really interesting thing that we found, and this has been true in so many areas of of work on food waste and elsewhere, is that what people said was the law was not actually the law. So 
This happens sometimes. That's why some lawyers are here to help. Um, so what he, what what he was told by by the food bank, Greater Boston Food Bank, and other food banks and food recovery organizations was that Massachusetts law prohibited sale or donation after the date. What we learned was actually that the way that Massachusetts law is written is that you can sell or donate food after the date as long as the food is wholesome, which I'll come back to. It's kind of a confusing term, but you know, as long as it's safe, if you have no reason to think it's not safe. Um, and the food is segregated from food that's before the date, and then it's clearly labeled. So you can understand why a major food bank or food recovery organization would say, this is too onerous. We can't bring in the scale of the food that they're bringing in through a food bank and then distributing out. We can't separately box and label everything. So they just sort of said, our policy is we're not going to do this so that we don't run afoul of the state law. And so that was really great for him. We got really excited. You know, we can actually do this. Um, but he was curious, are there any states that have better laws? Like, could we even make the Massachusetts law clear? So we started looking. We did, you know, the Northeast, and then we spanned out more and more. And what we, what we learned, really, in our research was that um, every single state is regulating this differently. And so this sort of was what we spent a lot of time trying to fix. So I think the first thing to say is that the federal government could regulate the date labels on food. The federal government does have authority over products in interstate commerce. Most of our food is in interstate commerce. That's why we're able to regulate the, the nutrition facts panel and other ingredient information because this food is traveling around the country. And so for the same reason, the federal government could regulate date labels. Um, these labels are generally, for almost all foods, are a suggestion of peak quality, which I think is not what most people interpret them to be. Uh, but the federal government hasn't defined them or required them at all. And even now, just in the last few years, we see the FDA and USDA, which each regulate different parts of the food supply, are both recommending use of the term best if used by, partly as a result of this work and, and others of our partners sort of raising the, the alarm on the fact that this is really confusing. Um, but there's no requirement with the exception of infant formula um, on any food. And so what we found was two really big problems that come from this. The first is that states were able to regulate, and no two states have the same regulation, which is anything that would be based on science, you would think that at least a few states would have be doing the same thing. I think it's pretty clear that they're not based on food science, the fact that they're all different. Um, so 41 states regulate some food, 20 states then restrict sale or donation after that date. Um, so that doesn't really make that much sense. So in some states, they're actually requiring you to throw food away after the date, even though we know the date is just a quality date. And then consumers are really confused. There's a lot of evidence to show this. This is some data from a study that we did with Johns Hopkins and the National Consumers League. And what we found was that about 84% of consumers say that they're throwing food away after the date because they think it's unsafe. Um, so uh, both at the state level, we have states requiring food to be destroyed that is safe and healthy. At the household level, we have consumers saying, I don't know, when in doubt, throw it out, um, and wasting a lot of food and not really being free to kind of taste the food first and see if it tastes okay and then, and then eat it. Um, couple this with a, a group called Refed that we do a lot of work with, did, some, did a study looking at 27 different solutions to reduce food waste in the U.S. Policy, somewhere, somewhere um, technology, somewhere things businesses could do, and they found that standardizing date labels would be the single most cost-effective. The reason it's so cost-effective is we don't know exactly what the impact would be, but the cost is really low. So companies are already putting a label on. It would be standardizing those labels to something and then explaining to people what those meant so that once you know most food is labeled for a quality reason, that food can then be donated after that date and people can eat it after the date if they think it tastes okay. So what we've come to is, uh, I'll tell you our recommendations and then the progress that, that I think we've seen on this, on this front. So the recommendations really would be standardize the labels. 95% um, of food is labeled for quality, which means um, they found in tests that after a certain amount of time, people start to think it doesn't taste as good. Uh, in, in our own work, we had our students tasting past date milk and then milk that had been left out for a couple days. Um, and I was assured by the food safety expert we were working with that this was safe. Um, some people thought, like President Party included, thought that all the milks tasted fine, and some people thought that they didn't. And we learned that there are some people are super tasters, and so they're really sensitive, and others are not. And then there's even a class of people who are like underdeveloped tasters or whatever they're called. So there's a range, taste is a range. So I think liberating people to say, 
if this doesn't taste good, then we're not here as the, the food waste police saying you have to eat it. Um, but as long as you know that it's just about taste, you can kind of decide on your own. And then for that small category of foods where there might be a safety risk, and just to inform all of you, it's really things that are mostly ready to eat foods that are not reheated afterwards. So it's things like deli meat, um, unpasteurized milk and cheeses, and then like prepared food that you get at a grocery store. They have a risk of being contaminated beforehand. Nothing is like spontaneously being contaminated in your refrigerator. They have a risk that they are contaminated beforehand, and then that the um, pathogen could grow under refrigeration and you wouldn't eat it. I don't think people know that now. No one, people, we're not telling people, be really careful with your deli meat. So we'd actually be helping improve food safety if we kind of clarified. Um, so we would love to see that food could be, would only have one of these two labels. Educate businesses and consumers. We need to kind of tell people what this means to make sure that they know how to make good decisions. And then allowing donation past the quality date. So where we are right now is that we've had industry, uh, after a lot of pressure, came together and put out that um, the Grocery Manufacturers Association, which is now the Consumer Products Association, or will be in January, and the Food Marketing Institute have put out a voluntary standard, which would have the terms best if used by, used for quality, and then used by for that small group of foods where there should be uh, potential safety risk, or you should really think about discarding the foods. This is great, but as I showed you before, 41 states regulate date labels. So in, in more than half of states, you won't be able to use these standard labels right now unless every state changes their rules. So that's a problem. I think the other really big problem is we can't do comprehensive education if it's still not universal. So we've been really working really hard to try to get this into law. We've had some bills introduced at the federal level, including one that was introduced in July. Congress is a little busy right now with some other pressing matters, so um, we are not getting a ton of traction. Uh, but the, the good side has been that a lot of states have been doing this, and we've been, I'll show you in a minute, um, we've been tracking some state level policy efforts. And so Massachusetts is one example. They haven't passed it yet, but have introduced legislation to do this at the state level. So I think at the very least, if we have more states coalescing around this standard, we can start to kind of make this easier and educate people. And again, I don't think, I'm not naive to think this is going to change everything, but I do think it's a really low hanging fruit. It's easy to change. We already have had a lot of momentum around these standard labels, and I think this added little piece could really have a big impact. And I think when, I, when you think about consumers in their home, when we're doing education to people saying, you should keep food after the best of use by date and eat it if it tastes good, it can be paired with really people thinking more about the waste that they might have in their own home and being more thoughtful about what they're eating generally. So that's one area. Um, you know, I spent the most time on that. I'm going to talk about a few others, but just to kind of give the arc of like how we work on things and how we get to the issues we're working on. So as a clinic, we're, like I said, we're bringing in clients. Our clients aren't individuals in the way that my peers who run clinics that do housing work or like domestic violence work are representing an individual in court, but we are representing client organizations. So in this case, Daily Table said, I had this great idea. Can you help me understand the law so that I know what I can do in the current laws, and can you help us think about what we might want to change if we want the law to be friendlier to this innovation? Then we will put out, you know, in this case, when it's appropriate, we did confidential memos for Daily Table, but we found when we learned about this issue with date labels, with his consent, we, we published it into a report that really said this is something everyone should know about and put out recommendations. We do a lot of different things to kind of vet our policy ideas with bigger stakeholders. One thing we've done over the last few years is hosting some pretty big summits at Harvard Law School, um, and now our partners have been hosting them elsewhere, which is great, um, which are good ways to socialize some of the ideas. And then we actually work on, you know, we have representatives at all levels of government reach out and say, we're drafting a bill on food waste or on date labeling. Could you take a look at it? Can you give your input and help us strengthen it? Um, and this is a picture of a student of mine testifying a few years ago in D.C. City Council on a bill around food waste that was actually written by a former student of mine who was, now, who was then working in D.C. Council. Um, the bill passed. It's great. It it's, um, helps to standardize date labels and remove barriers to donation past the date. It included a tax incentive for food donation and a few other things. And just because I'm really excited, I have another student actually testifying today in D.C. City Council for a completely other topic, which is a bill that D.C. introduced to require continuing education of physicians in nutrition and diet. 
and uh, physicians, um, nurses, and then uh, some other health professionals. So it's kind of cool for them, too. They get to practice writing a testimony. We practice with them. We, like, ask them tough questions, and then they have to go out there and, you know, deliver the testimony and answer the hard questions. So let me talk about, like, one or two other areas, and then I'll make, make sure we have time to have questions and discussion, because there's so much here, and I think we're constantly learning of new of these legal areas that are barriers and trying to, you know, think about how do we break down that barrier and then how do we make the change. Um, I want to talk about this food safety area because this one's a really interesting one too. So this also came from early work with Daily Table and then work we had done with a bunch of uh, other client organizations that were startups in this space. And what we heard was that Across the board, health inspectors going into businesses were giving them widely varying guidance as to whether they could donate food and what, um, how to handle that food in order to safely donate it. Um, and so we were kind of thinking, like, how, what, is the, what is the deal? How can we fix this? So we have to go back to the knowledge we have about just how food safety is regulated. And what we know is that in the U.S., um, the federal government inspects manufacturing facilities and now farms, so the FDA also has that under their purview now. But the bulk of where we're hearing this was at retail stores and at restaurants and like at food uh, institutions like universities, et cetera, that had a big um, food management um, component. Uh, so those are all regulated actually by state or even local, but mainly under state law. But what we know is that those states are all basing their food safety laws on this model code that the FDA puts out called the FDA Food Code. So states could completely ignore it if they wanted to, but most of them choose to, to utilize it because it comes from um, a lot of acquired expertise. So states will take it and they'll take the pieces they want and the pieces that they don't, they'll leave out. The FDA Food Code doesn't mention donation anywhere in it. So therefore, most states also don't mention anywhere in their food safety laws anything about food donation. Um, so what you have are these health inspectors who are trained on this code, who are looking at state laws based on this code, going into different businesses and being presented with like really unusual arrangements to them. And health inspectors are somewhat risk averse. I don't know if anyone has been a health inspector who has spent time with them, but they are, um, I think of lawyers as being risk averse. I think health inspectors probably exceed us in their uh, unwillingness to take on risk, which is usually great, um, but what we what we were really curious about was like what you know what does the landscape look like at the state level and what can we do? So with a big working group that came out of one of our summits, we we did a survey of all of the head the food safety heads of every state. Um, it was interesting because some states have two different food safety officials. One regulates restaurants and a different one that regulates retail, like grocery store sales. So we ended up interviewing 63 individuals that were all like the top food safety person for either the entire state or for one of those two buckets within their state. And this was kind of what we found out. So we, we thought, you know, there are now, we found 12 states have either a law or regulation related to food donations, and then 14 states had some sort of guidance document. But when we drilled down, when we actually collected them and looked at them, what we found was that with the exception of Texas, which was pretty comprehensive, the rest of them were really narrow. So the two biggest areas that were included in these, one was um, safety around donating um, meat that had been hunted and was donated by hunters so that that meat could actually be processed into something and then donated. So it's quite narrow. This isn't like the thing we're all thinking about when we're thinking about donation, although it is a good source of food for, you know, especially in certain places where hunting is really popular. And I think it's really amazing that people were saying, we're wasting this, this venison that we hunted, let's get it to people. The other really common area was around share tables in schools, which are uh, something that a lot of schools are doing that USDA has really supported, which is when students take a food item that is in its wrapper and they don't eat it, they can put it on a table and other students who would like to get more can come up and take that afterwards. Um, so, but that doesn't really get to this issue that's this everyday question of, you know, I think about talking with the food service folks at Harvard Law School, and they were having this debate with the health inspectors about when we donate food, if we're donating it to a food, an organization less than a mile away, do we need to use a refrigerated truck for every donation? I think the answer should be no. If they're less than a mile away, the cost of acquiring refrigerated vehicles for every donation would not wouldn't make sense. There's not a safety reason for it, but there's nowhere for them to go for this information. And then the other really interesting question we asked to these food safety officials was, you know, would it be helpful for you if there was some guidance 
And we found all but one of our respondents said either yes or maybe when asked, do you wish there were some guidance that you could use so that you actually knew what were the best practices around donation. And we then asked about whether it should go in the FDA food code. The results there were a little more mixed, although I think on the whole, very few people said no, that wasn't an appropriate place. So the work that we did was we wrote, um, the FDA food code is based on this group called the Conference for Food Protection that meets every other year and comes up with where is the best food science right now, what should food safety rules look like. Um, so we, they, they, as a result of this, they formed a committee and they're debating right now language to propose to be added to the FDA food code, which would mean it would make its way into every state's rules and would clarify that, yes, donation is allowed. You know, here are the general rules of thumb about thinking about how that food should be handled and held. Um, clarifying, for example, that prepared food is allowed to be donated, which a lot of people seem to think it's not, but as long as it wasn't like on someone's plate and served to them, and it was kept at the right temperatures, then that food is able to be donated. So this one will be really interesting to watch. I'm going to mention one other, I think, just briefly because this was brought up, which is about liability protection. So I think this is a really good example of some of the other areas we've looked at, which is a really great policy that has not been as effective as one would hope. Um, so, we heard earlier one reason businesses might not donate is that they're afraid of litigation, afraid of the mean lawyers. Um, so, what we, what we, for 20, more than 20 years, we've had a law, a federal law that protects donors of food. We said, we want you to donate food, and as long as you, ha you weren't intentionally um, tampering with the food, you didn't put a razor blade in it, you weren't reckless, meaning you didn't see someone else put a razor blade in it and still pass it along, or you didn't, you know, know that it was kind of contaminated or likely to have been contaminated, if you're doing everything in the, the normal course of business and trying to manage for safety, you will be protected. Um, every single state also has a version of this, and some of them even offer more protection. You can't offer less, but they can offer a little bit more. But the issue is that still consistently when you ask restaurants, retailers, and manufacturers, more than 50% still report that the reason they don't donate is because of fear of liability. So we've been spending a lot of time trying to figure out what do we do about this. And I think there's really two main issues that we've, we've honed in on. Um, one is that there's a lot of unanswered questions. So I mentioned earlier um, in the context of Massachusetts date labeling rules that food has to be apparently wholesome. You can donate food that's wholesome. Does anyone know what wholesome means? It's, it's an undefined term. So, and and, and the, the liability protection goes on to say, it's wholesome if it meets all quality and labeling rules, although it's not clear what quality rules are. And then it exempts a bunch of food that, that otherwise would not meet quality rules. So what you hear across the board, I had a call two nights ago with a major um, food producer, um, you know, a food manufacturer saying, we want to donate, we've been donating end products that didn't go out to a store, but now we want to donate some of the uh, like work in progress, so the ingredients that we've prepared that aren't going into the product, but we have a lot of questions about this. Like, is it wholesome? Does it meet the food safety rules? Where do we find the food safety rules? So there's a lot of issues around this. Um, so we spent a lot of time trying to help people think through it, and we've been putting in a really big push to try to get an agency to give guidance on this. Um, and it's been harder than you would think. Um, I think partly it's exacerbated because in this administration, agencies aren't really allowed to put out guidance. So we may be waiting for some time, but I think when we know that there are a lot of businesses facing the same question, um, from looking at this from a policy and a systems lens, how can we answer all their questions more effectively? Um, and when Congress passed this, they didn't delegate an agency to take charge of this rule. So right now, there's really nowhere you can go to get, to get questions answered. All right, so let me skip these two and just briefly say um, a little bit on where we are in terms of progress. Um, so I think in the past few years, you know, partly through work we've done, but a, there's been a huge growing ecosystem working on this. And so these are just some of the things that have been introduced at the federal level and in bold ones that have actually been enacted. And I will just mention the U.S. Farm Bill, which is, was a really big endeavor of ours. So prior to the 2018 Farm Bill, we pass a farm bill every five years. We allocate nearly $500 billion for use over those five years on producing food and getting it to people, and not a single dollar or a single program thought about the issue of food going to waste. So we put out a report a couple years ago that really gave to Congress, here are 16 different things you could include in the farm bill. 
that, that would have an impact on this. And it was a really big, exciting success for us and for the students in the clinic who spent the late nights like brainstorming these ideas and vetting them with our partners that seven of those things we'd written about got into the farm ball along with a couple other provisions. Um, so now the, the challenge is really where the rubber meets the road in getting, the, getting USDA to kind of fully implement them. Um, but as one example, there's supposed to be guidance on this liability protection, um, and it's been a little bit hard to get that to go forward. There was also the creation of a liaison position in the USDA focused on food waste and food recovery. So a person who could actually coordinate and answer questions and help um, make sure that, that a lot of these challenges that are happening on the ground are brought to the level of agencies and Congress to make better decisions. We also track state laws. So this is where we are just in 2019. A lot of states have new legislatures that started in 2019 and they have a two-year term. And we're tracking right now um, about 80 bills that are, that are, that are tra traveling through state legislatures. Uh, and it's interesting just to see you know, where the most activity is. I think we would expect it to be on the coast, and you see that a little bit. New Jersey right now has 20 pending bills on food waste reduction, just New Jersey. So they're pretty, I don't know what's happening there, something awesome or not, I don't know. Um, but we saw, we've seen a lot of activity in some, in Texas, which has been interesting, and they've passed some really innovative policies around food waste production. So I think it's good for us to see this is really penetrating around the country. And then this is some of the top issues that we're seeing in state legislation this year. Um, as you can see, the top two are liability protection and tax incentives. So I didn't talk that much about tax. Um, but just to say a word about it, we have a really great federal deduction that you can claim for food you donate. The problem is that for businesses, small businesses and farms, they're allowed to claim that, but it's really difficult for them to claim. And just to take it a step further, when you think about farms, let's say the farm right now is going to put in all of this effort to harvest food, get it to someone in need, and then they're going to get a tax deduction in, in you know, April or May. That's not really how farms work. They're not like, great, I'll just bank on this money coming in eight months. Um, so I think some states are trying to figure out ways to get money more to farms more quickly and more easily, and that's what you're seeing with a lot of those. And then just lastly, we are now taking this on the road and are doing a project right now where we're going to be doing a comparative legal analysis on some of these same issues in 15 countries, working with food banks and food recovery uh, organizations in those countries to map some of the best practices and provide guidance to them on what the current laws are and then some recommendations that come from our interviews and discussions in country. And we'll have them on a website. We're working uh, with a group called the Global Food Banking Network on this. So we'll have a website where countries that aren't what some of our 15 can kind of look at what's happening elsewhere, what other countries have things like liability protection or tax incentives, and how might they think about um, reformulating their own policies to get rid of some of these barriers and to align incentives. Right. Uh, thank you, Emily. Um, we will. We have uh, about ten minutes or so to ask questions. So we'll bring the mics out, and you can ask Emily a question. Couple of questions if none of the students do yet. Um, first question is um, about the cost of changing the date labels. So you said you think there'd be little cost. That, that seems to be true for having a standard best buy, but used by where you have to define the date of some health risk seems like it would be very tricky for companies to do, and there'd be enormous amount of research and testing they'd have to do. So have, have you? formally looked at or thought about or talked to companies about that, because that seems like that would be a very high hurdle mm -hmm. and very litigious for them to have to figure out that date. Yeah. Um, and very costly. I think you're right. I mean, I don't know that the cost would be so much higher. I mean, I think what we're saying basically right now is most companies are putting a date on their food. So even in the states where it's not required, like New York's a really good example that there's no requirement of any date labels on food or that you, or any restriction on donating after the date. Um, but if you go in a store in New York, every food has a date label on it. I think what we're saying basically to companies is, you know whether you think you're labeling this for a safety reason or a quality reason, so just pick which one of those dates you think is appropriate. Um, not, not, to, not to put the safety reason on every, everyone. Right, exactly. So, so I, I think, you know, again, I think you're right that there may be some um, embedded costs that we're, you know, 
they may think more strongly about when they have a date, how are they coming to it. But I think the point is giving a lot more to the manufacturers to say, do you, if you think there's some risk beyond it just not tasting good, then you should use use by. And if, you, if you're really saying, you know, this yogurt, we think it's going to taste really good until this date, and then it might decline in taste, then use the then use the quality one. And we we it's been interesting, really, uh, process on date labels in particular because I think where we started in terms of the recommendations to where we are now has been a lot of evolution because of you know some of the the issues that have been raised by companies. And um, the other thing I would say now is that what we're saying in the in the federal law that was introduced is. No one's required to put a label on any food. It's just that if you choose to put one on, you have to only use one of these two, um, like label language. You can't put some other thing on there. Yeah. And then my second question is: you mentioned the, the fear of lawsuits for donation. Have you tracked and documented lawsuits to see how there common these are? What, what? There's none. So that would seem to be pretty important. I think so too. So it's really interesting. As a lawyer, I can say it cuts both ways. So what lawyers at companies will say is. Because there haven't been any lawsuits, we don't know how a court will treat this. So there's a lot of questions, you know, if you would it still come into the court, would you still have to appear? Like, at what point can you activate this sort of, uh, you know, um, defense of this immunity? And I think that those are some of the questions that, again, not having any, any court to look at to see the precedent, and then not having any guidance from an agency to say, here's how we'll interpret some of these things. I can see why a, a lawyer, especially for a big company with a lot of money on the line, would be would be a little bit worried. Yeah. Yeah. Emily, um, kind of building off that a little bit, I think I'm curious. In the, have you had conversations about maybe changing just some of the common label languages are specifically? Because mm -hmm. I think you showed an example of the ones that like the quality one is best if used by, yeah. and the food safety one is used by. For me, as a consumer, I. I that's like there's no difference there. And if I'm going to the grocery store, I'm not gonna yeah. make a decision on that. Like, have any of your, um, yeah, collaborators and people you've been consulting with mm -hmm. pushed for something? I don't know, like taste best by this or food safety risk after this date? Something That's very clear. Really good question. And I agree. I actually really don't personally love the labels we've ended up with. So the evolution of those has been. Um, when we first put out this report, we, we had a big conversation with the, the you know, GMA, FMI, the big trade groups, and they said the biggest barrier to, to standardizing date labels is going to be agreeing on the labels. So we thought, well, okay, well, it's certainly going to take some work, but, like, we can't not do it just because we can't agree. So I think from that posture, like, myself, our partners at, at NRDC and other organizations have said, what's the process we can embark on to kind of figure out the best labels? So in our study that I showed the data on the 84% um, of consumers throwing food away, we also asked people, among these labels, we'll give you, we use six different labels, which one do you think um, most, if you saw that on your food, would you think was about quality, and which one would you think was about safety? So I was really interested in the, the label. I like freshest before. And it was like, it's a new label. We're not using it. It's just, it's fresh. Like, taste is hard. Maybe, like, we're talking about freshness. Um, and what we found actually was very clearly best if used by one by a landslide in terms of, I think, more than 70% of people said, if I see best if used by, I think quality. So I think that one's the clearest. On the safety side, the one that came out the best in our survey was expires on, which is also great because it is, as you say, really different. Um, and used by was, was the second best, but it was a little bit mixed in terms of whether people thought it was quality or safety. Um, we couldn't get the main the industry groups to agree to use expires on, and um, so and I think part of it was that they didn't like the sound of it. You know, they didn't they thought that it might be confusing. Part of it was actually that other countries are using use by for the safety label, like that the EU uses that. So I think some of it was just like where we were politically in terms of um, thinking about trade and thinking about labeling as part of a bigger ecosystem. So I think you're right. I think. If I were picking my labels, like 100%, I wouldn't go with these. But this has been a really interesting process of just thinking about um, not letting the perfect be the enemy of the good, and you know, how can we come to something that will be at least better than where we are now? So yeah. Hi. Um, so currently, there's a huge push um, of switching to. Um, Fruits and vegetables, for example, rather than prepackaged foods. So, 
So obviously, based on your um, presentation, we see that there's a big push in terms of um, standardization. But in terms of fruits and vegetables, um, what do you think in terms of law would be some of the considerations to be had in terms of donations and things of that nature to divert and reduce the, the food losses? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, my first thought would be obviously food safety, let's say refrigeration mm -hmm. and things like that, but other things that you could possibly think of. Right, right. Um, yeah, and I think... I had this sort of internal hardship when we were started working on on date labels about I'm trying in, in most of my other work to tell people not to eat packaged foods and yet we're spending all this time making the labels better on packaged foods so I think you're right that you know broadening a look at what are we donating and 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 why um, in terms of, of produce on farms I think there's a couple of things one thing especially now that we're doing more global work and thinking about that map I showed at the beginning, that a lot of that is post-harvest. So in one of the countries we're working in is Argentina, and about 30 to 40 percent of all produce harvested in Argentina gets wasted on the way to a market. And um, so we've been really thinking about this in that context as well. Um, I think food safety is an issue. I think in in the the context in Argentina and elsewhere, it's a lot of it's about not having the the infrastructure to cool produce quickly enough. So if you harvest something and you can't cool it, then it will continue to ripen and root and then be like fruit juice by the time it gets to the market. And um, so we've been thinking about like what are the, you know, if you were to, it's not necessarily that each farm itself needs the funding, it's that you need funding for this bigger infrastructure. So we're, we're, we're playing with this a little bit and we started looking more at what are the other structures that like government could support some shared facilities that would help with that. Um, I think in the U.S. it's, Probably mostly it's, it's money to the farms um, or to people to harvest because I think the number one cost on farms would be if there's produce that they're not going to harvest because they've, they've already met the contract that they have or because the produce is imperfect. So it's like not, it isn't, you know, like a two pound carrot or whatever. Um, they're, the real rub is like how will we pay people to come harvest this to then donate it. And I think the best solution we've had so far has been tax incentives to farmers, but I think for the reasons I mentioned before, that may not really be the right answer. So there's some cool models right now, actually, uh, locally, Boston Area Gleaners is um, doing some work thinking about models to actually give some value to farmers for the farms where they're going and, and, and gleaning or kind of harvesting the product. Um, but I think you're right that there's sort of, there's more to do there, and that food is, is really valuable healthy food that we should be getting, especially to, to people in need. Yeah. We can take one more question, and then we will need to come to an end. One other interesting domain is innovation and technology. And so we have an alumno who works at Appeal. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a whole range of innovations. One of the first CRISPR uh, innovations yeah. in genetics was a non-browning uh, mushroom from Penn State. Can you, have you noticed any legal obstacles to some of the rollout of this mm -hmm. uh, that would preserve both appearance and taste and also safety? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. So uh, almost all of these innovations, if they're, the more innovative they are, the more legal barriers that they run into. And so we've been, we've been you know, I think in, on an individual basis, we'll kind of give counsel where we can on some of these. So, um, you know, an appeal, I can't really think of a legal issue that they're facing. It's more just like um, changing the markets and like socializing the product, um, but I do think for a lot of different products, they they kind of run into these questions about like I think about a lot of there's a lot of upcycling right now of food. So I've been talking to organizations that are taking like eggshells and turning the eggshell into an input into food. So if you're taking something that previously was waste and was trash and wasn't considered the food, and then putting it into the food stream, you run into um, a lot of questions. I think actually the number one question often for these newer foods is just even figuring out which agency regulates it because we have this breakdown between FDA and USDA and eggs is like one of those products that sort of, it's not totally clear where it lives. Um, so that's the one issue. I think, and I think the others are really, uh, to me it's, it's, a, it's a bigger question of, we don't, I don't think there's like still enough at the agency level knowledge about or interest in, in making change on this. And that means that these things can get stuck in limbo for some time. So I think it, a part of it is sort of, pushing on, on agencies, FDA, I think is further behind USDA, but just to say, if there are things that are out there that 
um, have a credible kind of benefit in terms of reducing waste, which we know has environmental impacts, um, you know, is there some way to fast track, like looking at them for whatever review is needed? So that's, that's where I'm starting to think about it a little bit because I think it's sort of, each issue is so different, but it's, it's how can we answer these issues more quickly so that we can, we can um, encourage innovation rather than cycle it? But it's, it's, you know, it's huge. Yeah. Emily, thank you so much for your presentation and for the questions. And if you enjoyed the presentation today, like I did, guess what? She'll be back in the spring uh, at the Graduate Student Paper uh, Conference. So, again, thank you so much, and we appreciate your time. Thank you.